Good morning, folks, and welcome to our online broadcast here at Grace Church Larbert for Sunday the 24th of May. We're continuing in this format for now, although uh, obviously we are closely monitoring uh, developments and government advice about when it might be possible for us to meet in person once again, which is what we long to do. Um, the elders will be discussing those issues soon and beginning to make preparations for that, and so do please pray for us in that process. Again, as always, a warm welcome to anyone visiting with us wherever you are in the world and wherever you are in your journey towards Christ or your journey with Christ, you are uh, most welcome. And uh, where possible, we'd love to see you too uh, when things open up and we can meet together again in person. For now, today, let's hear the living God call us to worship him uh, through his word. I'm going to read from Revelation 5 and invite you there in your own home to speak some of these words aloud with me. Uh, it should be clear, I think, from what comes up on screen. Um, and so let's read uh, and hear God's word in Revelation 5. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. We're going to pray together now, beginning with some words borrowed from Richard, Richard Baxter. Let's pray. O eternal, almighty and most gracious God, heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. Holy and revered is your name. You are praised by the heavenly hosts and in the congregation of your saints on earth. You are seen as holy by all who come near to you. We are sinful and unworthy dust. But because you invite us through our blessed mediator, Jesus Christ, we boldly present ourselves and our requests before you. Receive us graciously and help us by your spirit. Let your fear be upon us. Put your laws into our hearts and write them in our minds. Let your word come to us in power and be received in love with attentive, reverent and obedient minds. May your word be the savour of life in us. Cause us to be earnest in our prayers and joyful in our praises and to serve you today without distraction. Help us to find that a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere and that it is good for us to draw near to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Father, we acknowledge the greatness of your goodness to us. You provide gloriously for your world. And in these days when there is so much that troubles us, we acknowledge nonetheless that you owe us nothing and yet give us everything. We thank you especially for your love for your people, that great and growing gathering of men, women and children around your throne, offering blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever to you, the great God of glory, and to the Lamb, the one who was slain to purchase a people. We give thanks again for the grace of the gospel and for the love of the Lord Jesus for his people, his bride, for the price he paid for her and the redemption he purchased for her and the care with which he watches over her and for his purpose ultimately to perfect her. Father, hear our prayers and hear us as we pray together as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's important that as we come to God week by week, we do what we've just done, confessing our sins before him and seeking his forgiveness. And it is equally important that we hear the voice of the gospel, the sound of grace, assuring us that this forgiveness of God is freely and gladly given upon repentance and faith. And so uh, listen to these great words. This is from the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the great historic statements and teaching aids uh, of the church's faith. By true faith in Jesus Christ, I am righteous before God and heir to life everlasting. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and of still being inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned or been a sinner, and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. How glad we must be in the grace of our God. We're going to read from the Bible now from Matthew's Gospel. We're working our way through Matthew and uh, we come this morning to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a large and hugely important uh, section of Jesus' teaching. We'll be working through it, God willing, over the coming months, whether in this format or uh, together, we'll see. Uh, this morning we're going to begin by asking some basic questions about what this sermon is and who it's for and how it works and what it says. Uh, we'll be trying to get a, a kind of high-level overview of these coming chapters, Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, before we launch into the detail of it next week. Uh, we're getting some help in our service this morning from Generate, uh, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, Generate and Illuminate, our teenagers groups, have continued to meet online uh, throughout the lockdown, groups for teenagers and for young people. Um, we're really thankful to the leaders who have made that possible and worked away, and to the young people too for uh, just staying engaged with that. Two of our teenagers will be leading us in prayer uh, later on, but first we're going to read from the scriptures, and one of the Generate leaders, Andy Denham, is going to read for us. Today's reading is taken from Matthew, uh, reading Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 to uh, chapter 5, verse 12. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread through all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Boys and girls, you've just heard the beginning of a sermon, and uh, no ordinary sermon either, but a sermon that was preached by Jesus himself. And um, we're going to be thinking about it later in this service, and I'm going to preach a sermon about that sermon. Uh, and I hope you'll watch that part of the video too. 
As usual, I've sent out a, a couple of sheets, one for um, one for younger ones and one for slightly older ones, about P5 and upwards. Um, so if you don't have those, then pause me and you can go and print those off and uh, th those might help you when you're uh, listening to the sermon later on. Um, here's a question. Whether or not my sermon is any good, do you think Jesus' sermon uh, would be any good? I hope, I hope you're saying yes there at home. Um, if you're saying no, then maybe mum and dad need to have a word with you. Um, Jesus, Jesus is perfect, isn't he, in everything that he does. And he's completely wise and he's completely obedient to God. He's the only person who has ever preached a perfect sermon. And so it's really, really important that we listen to what he says. And we'll be doing that over these next few months. And, and some of the things that he says we'll find are really, really surprising. So let me begin with this. I want to begin by showing you my favourite house. My favourite house. It's in Poland. Um, I've never been there. I've only ever seen pictures of it, uh, but I'd love to go there. Here it is. Isn't that weird? Isn't that an amazing house? Wouldn't you love to live there? To be fair, I'm, I don't think anyone actually does live there. I, it's a tourist attraction. Do you want to see what it's like inside? Let's have a look at the kitchen. Here's the kitchen. That make you feel a bit dizzy, maybe? Goodness me. How about if you're feeling dizzy, how about we turn it the other way around? Here we go. And that probably makes you feel a bit dizzier. So how about we go to the bedroom? There you go, there's your bedroom. You fancy a bedroom like that? I wonder what happens in this house at Christmas. Do you think it looks like this? I wonder what kind of car is parked in the driveway. Maybe they've got a car like this one. I tell you, it's amazing if you look online how many places there are like this in different parts of the world. And presumably, when you go to school, if you live in a house like this, when you go to school to learn geography, you study this kind of thing. Isn't that strange? It's all a bit disorienting, isn't it? It's all a bit weird. It makes you feel a bit dizzy and a bit kind of odd. Everything upside down. But one of the things that we'll discover in a few minutes in my sermon about Jesus' sermon is that we'll be thinking about how Jesus turns everything kind of upside down. You see it right from the beginning of the sermon. He says, blessed are the poor. That's not normally what we think, is it? Blessed are those who are mourning, who are sad. That's not what we normally think. Blessed are those who are hungry and who are thirsty. That's not what we normally think. Jesus is turning everything upside down. And what we're going to discover is that when Jesus comes into your life, nothing is ever quite the same again. Things change. He has a way of changing things. When he takes control of our lives, he changes things and changes them in good ways. Maybe it used to be that you lived or you, you thought, maybe you're not there yet, but you thought that, that what I want to do in my life is I want, to, I want to make as much money as I can and get all sorts of good things and, and, and live in an amazing house, whether it's the right way up or the wrong way up. Um, but I want to do all of that. And then Jesus comes into your life and, and suddenly you start to think a little bit more, not about how much you can get for yourself, but you start to think more about how much you can give to others. It's been turned upside down. Or maybe you used to just think as if you were the most important person in the world. That's how, that's how we all start off. We all think we're the most important person in the world. And then Jesus comes into your life and you realize that he's the most important, but, but also that other people are really important. And it starts to get much less and less important to you to get your own way. Jesus changes us in all of these ways and most of all in our lives. Without him, to be honest, we just do what we want to do. But with him, he turns it around so that we want to do what God wants us to do. We want to obey him and want to show our love for him. When we come to the sermon in a few minutes time, my sermon about Jesus' sermon, listen out for a little bit where I talk about two men, Paul, you remember Paul from the 
um, New Testament. He wrote lots of the New Testament. Paul and Silas go to a city called Thessalonica and they're preaching about Jesus and some people get really angry. They're really angry with them. There's a huge riot. It's chaos. And, and they, they want to haul them before the city authorities um, and they make an accusation against them. I want you to listen out to hear what that accusation is. And maybe when you hear it, you'll think of that map that we saw, that strange map of the world that we saw just a few minutes ago. And you'll remember the difference that Jesus makes when he comes into our lives and turns everything upside down. We're going to pray now. Uh, and I'm really grateful, as I said earlier, two of our uh, teenagers, two of our young people are going to lead us in that. So I'm going to hand over to um, Kate Sinclair and Tom Moody. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to praise and thank you for who you are and for all that you do for us. Thank you that you continue to provide for us. You meet our everyday needs. You clothe us. You feed us. You provide us with safe homes and loving families who care for us. You provide us with health care and have placed us in a country where we have safety and many freedoms others don't enjoy. Thank you and ev that even in times such as these, we can still pray to you and bring before the things which concern us. Thank you that you always listen to us. You always hear what we say and you're ready to act, to do the things we ask which conform to your will and purpose for us and which are ultimately for our blessing. We bring before you our world and the situation we are in at the moment. We pray for those who have lost loved ones at this time, whether it's due to coronavirus or not. Please, Lord, comfort those who mourn. We pray for those who are ill with coronavirus or other ailments. We ask that we provide healing where this is possible and freedom from pain where this is not. We pray for those in the medical care professions who treat and care for those in hospitals and for carers who go into people's homes. We ask that you would provide protection for all those who daily look after the sick and the frail. We pray for those known to us in these situations that you would protect them and strengthen them and encourage them. Pray for people all across the world as they deal with the disruption to work, healthcare, education and to social relationships. We pray for those jobs that are at risk that you would sustain and provide for their needs and help them as they worry about their future. We pray for your people, Christians all over the world, unable to meet together in church. We pray that the situation would soon be over and once again we'd be able to gather together to worship you. We pray for our governments and those in leadership who have to make difficult decisions about all of this. We pray for wisdom for them and that they would make decisions based only on what's best for all of us. We pray for young people at this time as we struggle with the disruption of education and not being able to spend time in person with our friends and wider families. We pray that you would help and protect us, support and sustain us through this period. Help us to continue to learn and to develop and help us to also to continue to support each other through the technology we have access to. Preserve and protect our mental health and well-being too, Lord. Help us to think clearly and to spend the time we have wisely and well to get to know you better through prayers and Bible study. Lord, we pray that in time to come, we would be able to look back at these days and see the good that you have been doing in all of our lives. Help us to see that even in these difficult days, your plan and purpose for us is being and has been fulfilled. Help us to see that just because we might not understand the situation now, you do. Help us to know and to trust that you are fully in control, that you love us and care for us at all times. 
In the meantime, Father God, we pray that you would continue to keep us safe, to bless us and provide for us and nurture us. Help us to continue to learn more of you each day. Help us to in this way in our daily lives and also now as we turn once again to your word. Make it living and active to us. Use it to encourage us, to train us, to rebuke us and correct us where we need this. Help us to grow as your people. Lead us, we pray, and continue to build your church. In all of these prayers, we ask that your name may be glorified and that Jesus would be proclaimed as Lord in our lives, individually, in your church and in the world as a whole. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was in June 1940 that France fell to the Nazis. It was believed by most that Germany would inevitably win the war and that resistance was futile. But within weeks, there were those who would accept no such thing. To remain silent while swastikas flew from the Eiffel Tower and while the National Assembly building was draped in a huge flag proclaiming Germany is victorious on all fronts, it just could not be tolerated. These were men and women determined to live free and French. And so, in contrast to the collaborationist regime at Vichy, the resistance began to form. In time, countless heroic and often sacrificial actions would undermine German war efforts and significantly help the Allied counter-invasion in 1944. There are times when you have to recognise that even where the rightful regime has been deposed, it still claims your loyalty. You still owe it your allegiance. And that means that you need to resist the temptation of the easier course, the collaborationist course, accepting the, leg the illegitimate rule of the usurpers, living by their standards, adopting their culture. You need to stand for something else. You sometimes hear people say, Look, I'm not into arguing over doctrines and beliefs. I, I just do my best to live by the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and if we could all just learn to do that, then the world would be a far better place. You, you generally find that most people who say that have never actually read the Sermon on the Mount. And if they do, they very quickly find a fair bit of it either utterly unrealistic or deeply offensive. But the assumption is that what they'll find there are basic moral principles, which are pretty obvious if you stop and think about it. In reality, this sermon is an invitation to join the revolution, to become part of the resistance. We've already seen in Matthew's Gospel time and time again that Jesus had come to announce the kingdom of God. God is the rightful ruler of this world, and yet his rule has been rejected by every man, woman, and child. There's a whole other regime being set up in his place called self, sitting on the throne that only God should occupy. Jesus calls us to stop living by the standards and culture and worldview and thinking of that regime and to decisively align ourselves with the rightful king. This sermon is his teaching on what kingdom life looks like, what it looks like to live free, loyal to God and serving his cause in occupied territory. He's painting a picture of what life in God's kingdom should be. We call this the Sermon on the Mount, but it might be better to think of it like an extended teaching session. It's almost like a retreat or a church weekend with uh, large blocks of teaching. Uh, Matthew isn't claiming, I don't think, to be reporting Jesus' words verbatim, as if he had recorded it all on his phone and transcribed it later, word for word. This is more like his sermon notes from the weekend, his summary of the teaching, but of course a summary which has itself been guided by the Holy Spirit. I've described this as an astonishing sermon, and the reason I call it that is that it astonished those who heard it. If you have a Bible there, hope you do, flick forward to chapter 7, Matthew 7, verse 28. That's where we come to the end of this sermon, Matthew 7, 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, 
for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. That's an interesting contrast, isn't it? These people were used to being taught by men who had no authority. And now, as Jesus preaches, there is weight to his words. They land in the hearts of his hearers. This isn't someone presenting an abstract thesis, interesting thoughts, something maybe worth mulling over sometime. This is compelling and urgent and powerful and real and important. This demands to be heard and it demands to be obeyed. When people hear Jesus speak about this kingdom life, they're thinking two things. Number one, this is true. This is what it would look like to live for God. And number two, I need to do this. I need a new life. So here's what I want us to, to do this morning. We're going to look at two introductory things, big picture things to help us to orient ourselves at the beginning of this major section of Jesus' teaching. And then I want to give a brief overview of the main themes, if you like, of the Sermon on the Mount. It'll take us a good few months to work through Matthew 5, 6 and 7, God willing. And the danger, of course, is that you can't see the wood for the trees. So this morning we're taking a step back. We're trying to get a view of the whole forest. Here's the first thing that's really important that we understand about the Sermon on the Mount. It's preached to believers. It's preached to believers. We've seen that there were large crowds listening in. They were astonished at what they heard. But notice what it actually says at verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus has been healing and preaching and so on, huge crowds have come. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his, opened his mouth and taught them. His disciples may, may well mean the twelve, uh, or it may mean a larger group, a looser group of those uh, following him. But the point is that this teaching was directed to people who had already made a clear commitment to follow Christ. It wasn't directed out there at the world in general, but at God's people in particular, those who had been received into the kingdom and so now needed to learn how to live the life of the kingdom. Now, that observation may not seem particularly earth-shattering, but it's actually crucially important. It's crucially important that we recognise it now and remember it in the months to come. To see why, it helps to draw a parallel, which is probably in the back of Matthew's mind. Remember how much we've already seen about the, just the mass of connections that he sees between the Old Testament, the, the whole sweep of God's dealings with his people over centuries, and the person and work of Jesus. Jesus completes and fulfills the stories of Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Israel, and so on. So consider Moses. Moses leads the people out of Egypt, through the waters of the Red Sea, on through the testing of the wilderness, until they come to Sinai, where he ascends the mountain to receive the law of God and pass it on to the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, Jesus comes out of Egypt, passes through the waters of baptism, enters the wilderness to be tested, and then comes to the mountain where he receives from God teaching about the Christian life, which he passes on to the twelve disciples. You can see so clearly the, the recapitulation, if you like, by Jesus of the pattern of Moses. With Moses, the order of events was always important. First, God redeems his people by grace alone, and then, in response to this, God's people are called to live in covenant with him. It's really important that the exodus happens first and the law is given later. That's why in Exodus 20, before God issues any of the Ten Commandments, he begins, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Only then, with that understanding, can the response of obedience and covenant keeping follow? Our obedience is always response to grace. And so God's people of old 
were commanded to obey, not in order to become his people, but because they were his people. Exactly the same principle applies here. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his uh, remarkable series of expositions in Matthew 5-7, to insisted at the beginning, we are not told in the Sermon on the Mount, live like this and you will become Christian. Rather, we are told, because you're a Christian, live like this. Now that means that although everyone should obey God in everything because he is God and all disobedience to, to God is sin, in another sense it would be foolish of us to expect anyone to live by this teaching who hasn't first been renewed from within by the Holy Spirit. Because if we truly listen to this astonishing sermon, it will search us. Let me tell you, if you've never known what Hebrews means when it says that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, if you've never felt what it means when it says that as the Word of God speaks, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account, then listen to the Sermon on the Mount. You will experience these things here. Pay attention and you'll know. You ever done an exercise workout and, and afterwards you find yourself saying, my, my muscles are aching in places I didn't know I had muscles? Listen to this sermon with an honest spirit and you'll find Jesus speaking into places in your heart that you didn't even know were there. And it will be revealed to you how laughably ridiculous it is to say glibly, I just live by the Sermon on the Mount. I wish everyone would. There's only one person who has ever lived this way with complete consistency. And that's the one who preached the sermon. And the only way we can even begin to live like this is if God first redeems us and transforms us into new men and women. We need to be changed from the inside out because from the inside out is just how the gospel works. Legalism and moralism try to turn that on its head, try to reverse it. If I change my external behaviour, that will make me into the person I should be. No, you need God to make you into the person you should be so that you can then become who you are in Christ. United to him in baptism and with the constant help of the Holy Spirit, you can begin to live this new life. But only once you're crystal clear that you truly belong to the rightful king, can you join the resistance and fight for him? And what you'll find then if you do is that this really is a revolution. In a world that has rejected God, it is a truly radical, revolutionary thing to live as one for whom God really is king. And so this is the second preliminary thing that we need to have in place before we go any further. So throughout the New Testament, the kingdom of God is one in which the values and standards of this fallen world are just turned on their head. That's why the Sermon on the Mount can actually be quite disorienting when we first listen to it. Let Jesus say what he wants to say rather than just assuming from the beginning that he's basically telling us to be nice to each other. That's why it's a sermon that astonishes and shocks and challenges. In the kingdom of heaven, the unimportant are important. The weak are strong, the humble are exalted, the proud are laid low. You see it right from the beginning. He, he starts with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, the mourning, the meek, the hungry. This is, this is not how the world thinks. Do you remember Acts 17 when Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica? Their preaching causes a riot. And uh, there's a rabble goes looking for them to haul them before the authorities. And this is their complaint. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. Jesus. Those two things are connected. Another king 
and turning the world upside down. That's exactly what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. These chapters present to us an understanding of life and a way of life which is the polar opposite of everything that our world assumes to be true. This is revolutionary. And although we'll come to it all in the coming weeks, God willing, we'll consider it at more leisurely pace then. For the rest of our time this morning, I just want to introduce some main themes of this astonishing sermon. There are various ways that we could do that, but I want to borrow a familiar triad that we find in various places in the New Testament um, uh, as a summary of the heart of the Christian life. You'll know that at various points, the New Testament speaks, uh, speaks in terms of faith, hope, and love. These are core characteristics of the Christian believer because they are core gifts of God. They are the, the precious essence, if you like, of what give, God gives to us through Christ. And, and it, seem, it seems to me, uh, looking through this sermon, that we can see these things really clearly here shaping kingdom life. I think that's quite instructive that we can so naturally look at it in these terms. Because it confirms that all of this teaching, although it is deep and soul-searching and challenging, it's essentially a description of what God intends the ordinary Christian life to look like. So let me draw out three things then from these three things from uh, the Sermon on the Mount. In the first place, the Sermon on the Mount calls us to exercise revolutionary faith, new depths of trust and obedience. I think one of the most striking things about this part of the Bible is the way in which it leaves no part of us untouched. It has a, a breadth to it. It stretches out into every part of our lives. Citizens of the kingdom recognize that the king rules over everything. Here, near the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, we, we're learning that to follow him is not to have a religious aspect to your life or to have certain times when you think about God or to have certain areas over here where he helps you or influences you. No, to be a follower of Christ is to subject every part of who you are and how you daily live to his rule. There's nothing held back. And so, we'll find as we go through this sermon that Jesus pokes his nose into your home, your relationships, your workplace, your kitchen, your dining room, your bedroom, your checkbook, your internet search history, everywhere. He knows it all and he claims the right to rule it all. Now, that absolutely does not mean that kingdom life is a life of legalism and rule keeping or, or of fear and subservience. That's a travesty of Christian faith. It's a profound misunderstanding. The Christian is someone who loves Christ and longs to please Christ and so lives for Christ. It's not about rules at all. It's about the devotion of the heart. And that's why, alongside the breadth of this sermon, and equally important to it, we find that this is a, this is a sermon with depth. I don't just mean it's, it's profound teaching, although it certainly is. I mean that it probes deeply into us. And while some have never really read it and assume it's just common sense, really, there are others who have read it deeply and actually despaired of it. This is impossible, they say. No one can live like this. Now that's wrong, because we've seen that Jesus did, and we've seen that we are baptised into him and have his spirit. This is God's intention for us. This is not some kind of theoretical thing. This is given to us to, to live by. But there is a reason for that reaction. It's actually a more realistic reaction than the reaction that says, yeah, I can do this. It's far more realistic to say this is impossible. Because not only does this sermon stretch out into every part of us, but it digs down into every part of every part of us. Sharper than a two-edged sword, the words of Jesus cut into us deeper and deeper and they leave nothing untouched. Only by ignoring the radical nature of this teaching can we evade that. And so constantly throughout this sermon, Jesus makes clear that he's going to poke his nose not only into every aspect of your outward life, but into your brain and into your heart and into the deepest places of your soul. He's relentless. Not only are your words and actions to be surrendered to your king, 
but so are the deepest thoughts of your mind and of your heart. He digs right down. He just keeps going and doesn't stop. He gets right down into the, 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 the essence of everything that matters to you the most. Your affections, your emotions, your ambitions, everything that fires you up. There are no secrets here. There's nothing exempt from his rule. And so he moves past actions and on, and, and on into motivations. He gets to the heart of everything. When someone angers you, he says, it's not enough just to not punch him in the face. Jesus calls you to love him. When, when the temptation of wrongful desire comes to you, it's not enough just to not commit adultery. Jesus calls you to maintain purity of heart and thought and cut your eye out rather than let it cause you to sin. When circumstances make you anxious, Jesus calls you to new depths of trust. No matter what's going on, there could be a global pandemic going on, but do not be anxious for your father knows your need. This is revolutionary faith, turning everything upside down. It's so challenging. Obey me in everything. Trust me for everything. Secondly, this sermon is a call and invitation to revolutionary hope. New heights of joy and expectancy. If you think this is a miserable, restricted, oppressed life, you've not understood at all. This is the life of liberty because this is who we were meant to be, who we were made to be and how we were made to live. And entrusting ourselves into the hands of this king and into the realm of this kingdom, we have hope and security beyond measure. This is an eternal kingdom and it brings supreme blessing to its citizens. Again, how does Jesus begin this sermon? Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. He begins by showing actually how even those the world considers cursed, the poor, the mourning, the meek and the hungry, are blessed by God. He shows how those the world considers fools, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, the persecuted, are blessed by God. And as we follow through this sermon, we'll find that part of its revolutionary nature is that Jesus is always turning appearance on its head. What appears to be desirable is fleeting. What appears to be worthless is treasure. This is what it means to live by faith, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so in chapter 6, the citizen of the kingdom of heaven lays up treasure, not on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but in heaven, where both his treasure and his heart belong. The citizens of the kingdom refuse to be anxious, but trust God for tomorrow. And knowing that he knows our need and loves us, they seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The citizen of the kingdom knows that when she simply asks, it will be given to her. And when she seeks, she will find. And when she knocks, it will be opened to her. For she has a father in heaven who loves to give good gifts to his children. The citizen of the kingdom of heaven builds his house on the rock of Jesus' words, knowing that no storm will destroy such a house, but it will stand forever. You have this sense throughout these chapters of Jesus drawing out our trust. Come to my Father. Put your trust in him. He is trustworthy. He will not let you down. He loves you. It is safe to surrender everything to him. You can have supreme confidence in him. You can have a hope that is unfading, unfailing. Jesus calls us to revolutionary faith, new depths of trust and obedience. He calls us to revolutionary hope, new heights of joy and expectancy. And thirdly, he calls us to revolutionary love, new breaths of service and sacrifice. I guess this is what people tend to think of first when they think of the Sermon on the Mount. But even here, 
the truly radical nature of Jesus' teaching is so often overlooked. What he tells us here is that the man, woman or child who belongs to the kingdom of heaven is called to love in an utterly transformed way. That's what lies behind so many of the commands that we'll find in this section of the Bible. Don't be angry with others. Why? Because anger is a contradiction of love. Don't lust because lust is not love. Don't retaliate because retaliation is not love. Don't boast because boasting isn't love. And then at certain points, the the love command comes to the surface, if you like, and it's expressed in terms of the service and sacrifice that we're to offer to others. Love your enemies, he says. And you know the problem with that? The problem with that is that he means it. It is is not hyperbole. It's not a figure of speech. You consider in your mind those who, by the standards of this world, are your enemies, either because you've made it so or because they've made it so. And in an act of resistance to the standards of this world, you choose to live and to love by the standards of another. This world doesn't commend loving enemies. Doesn't even think it's a good thing. That's just silly. The citizens of the kingdom are called to love their enemies and to pray for those who persecute them. Why? Because when you do that, then you will be true children of your Father who is in heaven. Give to the needy, he says, but secretly. Don't tell others what you're doing. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That is a figure of speech, but you know what it means. Do you just love reading in the national news about some celebrity or other who's given X pounds to such and such a charity? Every time I read that, the first thought that comes into my mind is, why do I know about this? Might be a very good thing to do, but publicising it might suggest that love maybe isn't your only motive or even your main motive. In everything, says Jesus, do to others what you would wish them to do to you. Even that is far more radical than we usually appreciate. He's telling us to be as concerned for the well-being of others as we are for our own. He's telling us to put ourselves in others' shoes and to seek to be a blessing to them. This is revolutionary. This turns the world upside down. There is no other teaching like this and there is no other power to make possible a life like this. Back in the 1500s, in the time of the Reformation, uh, William Tyndale was persecuted uh, for the crime. He was arrested and eventually martyred uh, at the age of 42 for the crime of translating the Bible into English so that ordinary people could read it for themselves. They tied him to a stake. He was strangled to death, and then they burned his body. Before his death, he spent 11 years on the run, evading capture by these people who were determined to kill him. But during that time, he wrote to them. He told them that the reason he did what he did was because, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5, The love of Christ compels us. And so he wrote, We are ready to suffer for Christ and to lose life and all for our very enemies, to bring them unto Christ. Christ is all to a Christian man. Christ is the cause why I love thee, why I am ready to do the utmost of my power for thee, and why I pray for thee. And as long as the cause abides, so long lasts the effect, even as it is always day, so long as the sun shineth. Do therefore the worst thou canst unto me. Take away my goods. Take away my good name. Yet as long as Christ remaineth in my heart, so long I love thee not a whit the less. And so long art thou as dear to me as my own soul. If that's not revolutionary, I don't know what is or ever has been. 
the kingdom of heaven calls its citizens to revolutionary love, reaching out to new breaths of service and sacrifice. The kingdom calls us to this life, but also, crucially, it creates this life in us. These are gifts of God to his people. Faith to trust him. Hope to rejoice in him. Love to serve him. But no wonder that as the people listened to this sermon, they were astonished. Here was the most radical possible teaching, the unqualified call to join the revolution, to live in this world by the standards of another, coming to them from the lips of this man, and yet with all the authority of God. How desperately our world needs this kind of church. How desperately it needs to see this kind of life, not just hear about it, but see it, become aware that, that right here in Larbert, there are people who are modeling a whole different way of life. How desperately people need to see that there's another king and there's another life, an infinitely better life that he has designed for his people. That's what it, what it means to be the salt of the earth, to be a city set on a hill, to be a light for the world. Oh, Matthew 5. Last week, such a clear illustration of this. Last week, I heard an interview with the historian Tom Holland, uh, who recently wrote a fascinating book called Dominion, which charts the influence of the Christian faith on the Western world. He's not a Christian, and uh, there are certain areas, I think, where he misunderstands Christianity quite badly, but it's nevertheless an insightful book. He was being interviewed because he wrote an article in a national newspaper calling on the church to speak prophetically into the current crisis. Stop sounding like middle managers, he said, and bring us something we're not going to hear from anyone else. History has demonstrated, he said, that whether you believe it's actually true or not, and of course we do, Christianity has unique resources to speak to the human condition and to address the deepest of human needs. Isn't that fascinating advice coming from an unbeliever? Please do what God has called you to do. Please speak truth into this chaos. And do you know what happened the next day? The next day, the Archbishop of Canterbury was quoted in the newspapers commenting on the wisdom or otherwise of returning to fiscal austerity after coronavirus passes. And he sounded for all the world like a middle manager. Do we or do we not believe the gospel? Is there or is there not an eternity before us? In a world increasingly fractured and fragmented and fearful and forlorn, do we or do we not have good news of a God who reigns, whose purposes are gracious and who can be trusted? Do we or do we not have a sure and certain hope grounded in solid truth? Do we or do we not have words of love to share and a life of love to live? How crucially important it will be in the days that lie before us, short, medium and long term, that we hold out to the world a whole other way of life, a radically countercultural way, not, not so that we can just ask people to, to, to come and see that, you know, come and try and live this way. No, but so that we can point them to the one whose kingdom this is. Hear this astonishing sermon. Join the revolution. Let's pray together. God our Father, we recognise that the first and most urgent thing that we need to do as we hear the teaching of your Son is to repent. 
Father, forgive us for the many times when we have domesticated him, when we have reduced his teaching to something far, far less than it is. We pray that you might give us ears to hear all that he has to say to us today and in these coming weeks and months. We pray that you might speak to us that as we submit to your word, as we hear your son preach, that you would speak afresh to us. These would be living words to us by your Holy Spirit. Father, we so often are tempted to think, if only we had been there and heard. You have told us that as we open the pages of your word, the spirit of your son speaks afresh. We are there. We hear his voice. Give us ears to hear. Give us soft hearts to receive what he has to say. Father, we thank you that these things of which he speaks are gifts of God to his people revolutionary faith, revolutionary hope, revolutionary love. Faith and hope and love to renew us and to change us, to change our lives forever. We thank you that these are gifts that you give to us, but we pray that we might receive and embrace these gifts, that we might hear the call of this kingdom, that we might join the revolution and the resisting all temptation to collaborate with the forces of this world. We might live by the standards of another. Father, may we always remember who our king is. May we always remember where our loyalty is. And may we always live for you, for our good, for our joy, and for your glory. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the blessing which God pronounces upon his people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.